Hello and welcome to the channel. Today we are in Westminster Abbey, home to many English and Scottish monarchs who have been buried here over the years. We are going to have a look at the occupier of this tomb here, her later life, execution and burials. Yes, burials as in plural. She was one of the most enigmatic and fascinating women of the 16th century, Mary, Queen of Scots. So join me to take a look at Mary's story and how she ended up in here. Let's first have a quick recap of Mary's life up until her well-documented travails. Mary's father was James V of Scotland and her mother was Mary of Guy, who was French. They had just one child, Mary Stuart. Mary became the legitimate monarch of Scotland after her father passed away six days after she was born. Mary received Tudor blood as she was the great granddaughter of Henry VII and her paternal grandmother was Margaret Tudor, the older sister of Henry VIII. After Mary's father died and she became Queen Regnant of Scotland, King Henry VIII of England tried in vain to gain control of Mary, but failed. At the age of five, Mary was sent to France by her mother. She was raised at the court of King Henry II and his queen, Catherine de' Medici, where her mother's powerful family members helped raise her as well as their own huge family. The education of Mary was not neglected, despite her charmed upbringing in opulence, which included frequent hunting and dancing, at which she excelled. She was taught Italian, Latin, Spanish and a little Greek. Her first language though became French, and Mary increasingly identified as a French woman rather than a Scot. At the time of her marriage to Francis, the Dauphin, eldest son of Henry and Catherine, in April 1558, Mary embodied the ideal of the Renaissance princess in terms of her outstanding beauty, great stature, she was in fact known to be around 5 feet 11 inches tall, amber eyes, red gold hair and a taste for music and poetry. Mary had a genuine affection for her young husband despite the fact that their relationship was only intended to be a political union and aimed at uniting France and Scotland. It is also thought that the marriage was probably never consummated, but there is no proof either way. Mary was next in line to the English throne as a result of her Tudor ancestry after Elizabeth Tudor assumed the crown in November 1558 and of course became Elizabeth I. Roman Catholics who believed that Henry VIII's marriage to Anne Boleyn and divorce from Catherine of Aragon were unlawful even viewed Mary as the legitimate monarch in place of Elizabeth. Henry II of France, Mary's husband therefore, asserted his claim to the English crown on Mary's behalf. Francis succeeded Henry II of France to the French throne in 1559, elevating Mary to the heady heights of Queen Consuls of France. However, Francis died suddenly in December 1560, leaving Mary a widow at the age of just 18. When Mary eventually arrived back in Scotland in August 1561, she found that her sheltered upbringing in France had left her totally unprepared to handle the variety of issues she was now experiencing. Elizabeth had been enraged by Mary's prior claims to the English crown and she refused to accept Mary as her heir, despite the fact that Mary valued her English rights highly and was unquestionably a royal by nature. Yet, for the first few years of her administration, Mary did well, supported in particular by her policy of religious tolerance and with the help of her biological half-brother, James, Earl of Moray. Things all good well initially for Mary, the spectacle of a very attractive young queen leading a wonderful court life and delighting in her excursions around the nation, sat well with many a Scot. (laughs) 
Things, though, soon started to go downhill for Mary. Her second marriage to her cousin, Henry Stuart, Earl of Darnley, who was the son of Matthew Stuart, the fourth Earl of Lennox, marked the beginning of a terrible chain of events that ultimately led to her demise. As a hasty act of love, Mary wed the charming Earl of Darnley in July 1565, pretty much against everyone's advice. It was a terrible decision because by this marriage she enraged everyone involved in Scotland's political system, including, and most importantly, Elizabeth. Both Mary and Darnley were both claimants to the English throne through Elizabeth's aunt, Margaret Tudor. Elizabeth therefore felt threatened by the marriage. If the couple had any children, they would receive a combined claim that was even stronger than Mary's alone. Mary seemed to have been more passionate than rational in her insistence on the marriage. Elizabeth was enraged by the relationship and believed that since Darnley was both her cousin and an English subject, the marriage should not have taken place without her full consent. James, Earl of Moray, Mary's half-brother, promptly rebelled out of resentment over the Lennox family's ascent to power. He joined with other Protestant lords in open rebellion. Mary's support was boosted by the release and restoration to favour of James Hepburn, 4th Earl of Bothwell, from exile in France. However, the rebellion petered out though when Moray was unable to get enough support. Moray left Scotland in that October for the safety of England. Darnley's character was considered as dubious at best and fell far short of the expectations set out by his outward appearance. He was considered weak, violent and ambitious, a dangerous combination. Darnley became conceited and very arrogant, not satisfied with his role as King Consort. He requested the Crown Matrimonial, which would have enabled him to become co-sovereign and would have given him the authority to retain the Scottish throne in the event that he outlived his wife. Despite being pregnant, Mary rejected his proposal and their marriage deteriorated. He resented her association with David Rizzio, her Catholic private secretary, and the man who was thought by some to be the father of Mary's expectant child, although these were simply rumours that had no hard facts behind them. By March 1566, Darnley had joined a clandestine plot with Protestant lords, including the nobility who had rebelled against Mary alongside her half-brother, Moray. At a dinner party in Holyrood Palace on March the 9th, a group of the conspirators joined by Darnley killed Rizzio in front of Mary, who was expecting at the time. Disillusioned Darnley changed sides though throughout the course of the following two days. Mary though came to believe that her husband had intended for her to die. Their son James was born in June, but it didn't help the couple to reconcile. Mary now sought a means to get out of the awkward position she had found herself in. After all, she finally had the heir she had long wished for. The most complicated and divisive time in Mary's reign came over the next eight months. Mary's critics assert that it was at this time that she began an adulterous relationship with Bothwell and that she plotted with him Darnley's demise and their own subsequent marriage. But other than the highly questionable so-called casket letters, poems and letters allegedly written by Mary to Bothwell, but whose provenance is now widely regarded as dubious by most historians, there is no contemporaneous documentation of this love connection prior to Darnley's passing. Yet, following a severe sickness in October 1566, which left her in quite bad health and her spirits depressed, it is known that Mary definitely thought about divorcing Darnley, as the marriage had obviously deteriorated beyond repair. Mary persuaded her husband to go back to Edinburgh in the latter part of January 1567. He used this time to recover from a health condition he had been suffering from. Mary visited him frequently, giving the impression that a reunion was on the cards. He stayed at the former abbey of Kirko Field, just inside the city walls. On the evening of February the 9th and the next morning of February the 10th, 1567, 
Mary visited her husband before going to a family member's wedding. An explosion destroyed Kirko Field in the small hours of the morning. Darnley was discovered dead in the grounds. It appeared that he had been attempting to flee. He died apparently from suffocation. No obvious signs of violence or strangling could be seen to the body though. This, of course, was extremely suspicious and the immediate chief suspects included Mary, Bothwell and Moray. Several explanations for the crime have been proposed, including the idea that Darnley may have fallen victim to his own trap while planning to blow up Mary. But the most plausible theory is the one that makes the most sense, that the nobility, who despised Darnley so much, were indeed the ones who were responsible. By the end of February, Bothwell was largely accepted as being the one responsible for the murder of Darnley. Mary consented when Darnley's father, Lennox, insisted that Bothwell be prosecuted before the Estates of Parliament, but Lennox's plea for a delay to gather evidence was turned down. After a seven-hour trial on April the 12th, Bothwell was declared innocent. This was due not only to Lennox's absence, but also the lack of any proof. Regardless of whether Mary knew about the crime, her actions afterward were fatally misguided and demonstrated how little she had access to sensible counsel in Scotland. Three months later, after Bothwell, the main suspect, had kidnapped Mary, there is evidence that he may well have raped her. She then consented to marrying Bothwell. If romance is ruled out as the driving force, Mary's actions can be attributed to her growing despair about her inability to control the affairs of a turbulent Scotland without a strong arm to support her, which was made all the worse by her continuing ill health. But Bothwell ended up being no more acceptable to Scotland's nobility any more than Darnley had. Confederate lords, a group of 26 Scottish peers, rose up against both Bothwell and Mary and organised their own army. However, there was no battle after both sides faced each other at Carberry Hill on June 15, 1567, as Mary's forces slowly dispersed due to desertion during the negotiations. The nobles then allowed Bothwell to make a safe exit, this was the last time Mary would ever see Bothwell. Mary was taken to Edinburgh by the Lords, where she was accused of adultery and murder by throngs of onlookers. She was held captive in Loch Leven Castle, which is situated on an island in the centre of Loch Leven. Sadly for Mary, she miscarried twins between July the 20th and July the 23rd. She was then compelled to cede power to her one-year-old son James on July the 24th, 1567. Bothwell was sent into exile while Moray was appointed regent. Bothwell went crazy and died in 1578 after being imprisoned in Denmark. With the aid of George Douglas, the brother of Sir William Douglas, who owned Loch Leven Castle, Mary managed to escape on May 2nd, 1568. She was able to assemble an army of 6,000 soldiers, which she used to confront Moray's weaker forces at the Battle of Langside on May 13th. However, the battle did not go well. Defeated, she fled to the south. She spent the night at Dundrennan Abbey before sailing a fishing boat across the Solway Firth into England. She arrived in Workington, Cumberland in northern England, where she spent the night at Workington Hall. She was placed in protective custody at Carlisle Castle on May the 18th by local authorities. Clearly, Mary had counted on Elizabeth's assistance in regaining her realm. Elizabeth, though, showed great caution and ordered an investigation into the actions of the Confederate Lords and the issue of Mary's involvement in Darnley's death. In the middle of July 1568, it was decided to send Mary to Bolton Castle as it was farther from the Scottish border, but still not too near London. Between October 1568 in January 1569, a conference or commission of inquiry was convened, first in York 
and then at Westminster. Meanwhile, Mary's allies in Scotland battled Regent Moray and his heirs in a civil war. When Elizabeth declared the investigation to be over, nothing was proven against the Confederate Lords or Mary, just as Elizabeth had desired. She didn't want to find Mary guilty or innocent of murder, primarily for political reasons. The conference was simply intended as a political exercise. There was never any intention to pursue a legal case. In the end, Moray served as regent once more and returned to Scotland, but Mary remained in English custody. Without finding her guilty or absolving her fellow sovereign, Elizabeth had been successful in keeping a Protestant government in place in Scotland. Mary's incarceration was protracted and tiresome and her only consolations were her religion, her ability at stitching and her love of tiny pets such as songbirds and lapdogs. Mary had access to her own domestic employees, which was always at least 16. For moving her possessions from house to house, she required 30 carts. Fine rugs and tapestries adorned her chambers. Her meals, which included a choice of 32 courses and were presented on silver plates, were cooked by her personal cooks. Her bed linen was changed daily. She spent seven summers in the spa town of Buxton and spent a lot of her time embroidering. She was only sometimes let outside under careful supervision. The most well-known images of Mary in black velvet and white veil dated from 1578. These demonstrate how her health suffered from a lack of exercise, she gained weight and her enticing looks waned. Naturally, she now focused all of her efforts on getting out of the imprisonment that she believed was unfair. She did this first by pleading, then when this proved fruitless by conspiring with others. Mary's status as a Catholic made her the obvious target for the aspirations of English Catholics who wanted to usurp the Protestant Queen Elizabeth as monarch. Queen Elizabeth was persuaded that Mary would always be a dangerous threat to her own status as Queen whilst Mary remained alive. This was after learning in 1586 of a conspiracy to kill her and start a Roman Catholic insurrection. A measure of how seriously Elizabeth took these threats to her safety can be seen by the legislation of the Bond of Association and the Act for the Queen's Safety, which authorised the execution of anybody who plotted against Elizabeth and sought to prevent a potential successor from gaining from her assassination. These were brought into being by Francis Walsingham, who was the Queen's principal secretary. As a result of her involvement in the Babington plot, Mary was detained on August the 11th, 1586, while she was out riding. She was then taken to Tixall Hall in Staffordshire. Francis Walsingham had intentionally planned for Mary's letters to be smuggled out of her place of imprisonment, Chartley, in an effort to trap her. Mary was duped into believing her letters were secret and secure when, in fact, Walsingham had decoded and read them. The letters made it obvious that Mary had approved of Elizabeth's attempted assassination. Mary was sent to Fotheringhay Castle for her trial. She faced a court of 36 noblemen, including Francis Walsingham, in October while she was being tried for treason under the Act for the Queen's Safety. Mary vigorously refuted the allegations in her defence. Look to your consciences, she admonished the jury and keep in mind that the world's theatre is larger than the Kingdom of England. She objected, claiming that she had been refused the chance to evaluate the evidence, that her papers had been taken away, that she had been denied access to legal representation, and that because she was a foreign anointed queen and had never been an English subject, she was not liable for treason. With only one commissioner, Lord Zouche, 
voicing any disagreement, she was found guilty on October the 25th and summarily given the death penalty. Even though the English Parliament urged Elizabeth to carry out the sentence, she was hesitant to authorise her execution. She was afraid of the repercussions and worried that the assassination of a Queen would set a bad precedent, especially if Mary's son, James, allied with the Catholic forces and attacked England as vengeance. It was then that Elizabeth asked Mary's final custodian, Paul A., if he would think of a covert method to shorten the life of Mary. But he refused as his conscience wouldn't let him. Elizabeth then signed the death warrant on February 1st, 1587. Ten members of the Privy Council of England decided to execute the sentence immediately on February 3rd. Interestingly, they did this without Elizabeth's knowledge. After being informed of her impending execution, Mary proceeded to pray, organised and distributed her possessions to her household, wrote a letter to the King of France and then wrote her final will. The Great Hall scaffolding was covered in black material or cloth. It was accessible by a couple of steps and was equipped with the executioner's block, three stalls, one for her and the remaining two for the Earls of Kent and Shrewsbury, who were there to witness Mary's execution. The remaining item was Mary's kneeling cushion. It was customary for the executioner to ask the person being put to death for forgiveness. So Executioner Bull and his aide kneeled before her and begged for their forgiveness. I forgive you with all my heart, for now I hope you shall make an end of all my troubles, Mary replied. She knelt down on the cushion in front of the block with her arms outstretched and one of her maids blindfolded her. She then uttered her last words in Latin, Into thy hands, O Lord, I commend my spirit. However, Mary was not executed with just one blow to the neck. Sadly for her, the initial strike struck the back of her head instead. The second blow was thankfully more successful and severed most of the neck save for a short section of sinew that was hacked through with the axe by the executioner. After that, the executioner raised her head in the air and said aloud, God save the Queen. Then, the auburn hair in his palm revealed itself to be a wig, and poor Mary's head dropped to the floor, exposing her very short grey hair. Now Elizabeth reportedly was furious upon hearing of Mary's death, and claimed that her aide, Davison, had defied her orders to keep the warrant to himself, and that the Privy Council had acted without her permission. Elizabeth, of course, was able to escape being directly stained by the stigma of Mary's execution due to her purposefully ambiguous directions. Davison was detained, imprisoned in the Tower of London, and later convicted of misprison. After Walsingham stepped in and spoke on his behalf, he was freed 19 months later. Her body was embalmed at Fotheringhay and her entrails were buried covertly within its grounds. She was subsequently kept in the castle for almost six months entombed in a lead coffin. In the end, Mary's wish to be buried in France close to her first husband, King Francois II, was denied by the Queen, who instead ordered her burial at Peterborough Cathedral. Mary, at least, had a lavish funeral. Even if she would not have liked the Protestant burial service and the reluctant sermon given by the Bishop of Lincoln due to her being a fervent Roman Catholic, it was decided to bury Mary opposite Catherine of Aragon's tomb. chariot draped in black velvet and decked with Queen Mary's ensigns, 
Her body was taken from Fotheringhay Castle between 1 and 2 in the morning on Sunday, July the 30th. The Dean and the Bishop of Peterborough, as well as other officials and members of Mary's household, accompanied the procession. Mary's body was placed in the vault upon Mary's arrival at the cathedral. Later on Monday afternoon, a large group of lords and ladies showed up for a lavish dinner at the Bishop's Palace, which was similarly draped in black. The clergy, lords and women assembled in the cathedral early the following morning to listen to the Bishop of Lincoln deliver a somewhat lightweight sermon, who went on to express the unsure hope and belief that Mary was indeed saved, despite her having died as a Catholic. The mourners then enjoyed yet another feast, and everyone then returned home after Mary's officials, according to tradition, broke their staves and placed them in the grave. Later, a sword, helmet and shield were hung above Mary's tomb. James I, Mary's son, gave the order in 1612 for her remains to be exhumed and taken from Peterborough Cathedral and transported to Westminster Abbey. The reburial took place on October the 11th of that year, and his royal warrant was dated September the 28th, 1612. A copy of the warrant is still hanging close by to the grave. Although there is no written record of the procession that accompanied the body to the Abbey, it appears that it was still a grand affair, with several lords present. At 6pm, the Dean of Westminster met the body in Clerkenwell. In the south aisle of the Lady Chapel, the King had this magnificent marble tomb built for her, which is decorated with an ornate canopy and a splendid white marble effigy. She is dressed in a long mantle which is brooch fastened and a laced ruff. It took William and Cornelius Cure several years to create the sculpture. At her feet is a Scottish lion wearing a crown. Thomas Bickford, a blacksmith, created an elaborate railing around the grave. Mary and Elizabeth I are thus laid to rest in Henry VII's chapel in opposing aisles. The grave of Margaret, Countess of Lennox, which bears a kneeling representation of Lord Darnley, is located next to Mary. Mary stirred up ferocious controversy in her own lifetime, earning the suitable moniker, the Daughter of Debate, from her cousin Queen Elizabeth. To her political opponents though, she was a calculating adulteress, if not a murderess, but to her supporters she was something very different. She was looked upon as a romantic and yet tragic figure, who they believed that Mary was someone that continually acted upon bad advice submitted by those that were closest to her. Someone who couldn't handle the pressures imposed and that she was only a pawn in the hands of cunning nobility who, as time went by, she found harder and harder to control. There is no hard and irrefutable evidence of her involvement in the murder of her husband Darnley, or, for that matter, of a plot with Bothwell save for some letters that she insisted were forged. Such charges are therefore based on pure conjecture. However, one thing that most agree with is that Mary's bravery throughout her botched execution ordeal contributed to the public perception of her now as a heroic victim. Historians over the years may have disagreed over Mary's dramatic story, but the general public's fascination with this 16th century femme fatale remains, and indeed, continues to grow unabated. Well, on that note, 
I would like to thank you for watching this video and please hit the like button if you have found it enlightening and do consider subscribing if you would like to see more content such as this. If you fancy a trip through the lives of other famous people and events, please click on one of the other productions shown above. Once again, thanks for watching and I really hope to see you next time. Bye for now.